Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, my name is John Allen, and I'm the president of the Brookings Institution, and it is a great pleasure uh, to welcome you all today to our discussion on the impact of COVID-19 on the hospitality industry. This morning's event, uh, one of the series of reopening webinars, could not be timelier. As states across the country continue to reopen, moving into phases two, three, and even four, many hospitality businesses are grappling with the harsh realities of this new normal. Indeed, while some states have aggressively pursued reopening, those strategies are, are now moving into potentially being reversed as reopening has created additional challenges. What went wrong? Ladies and gentlemen, for decades, the hospitality industry stood as the stalwart of the American economy. Many of the unique intersections of entertainment, leisure, and service were on display within this industry and has maintained the livelihoods of many communities and cities across the country, with an estimated 16.7 million people supporting our leisure and hospitality services in 2019 alone. Offering not only a means of work, the hospitality industry has also long served as a bedrock of American culture and identity. Indeed, of the millions and millions of people who visit the United States each year, and hopefully will return soon to visit the United States, more often than not, their experiences will be heavily impacted by the many local restaurants and bars and hotels available to them across our 50 states. So truly, this industry embodies who we are as a people, and in many ways, it's a reflection of the vibrancy of this great country. And to paraphrase Anthony Bourdain, food, or in this case, hospitality, is everything we are. Unfortunately, with the advent of COVID-19, the hospitality industry has become one of the most vulnerable industries during this global health crisis. An estimated 35.9% of the leisure and hospitality industry are now currently unemployed. Those who remain face every day the risk of contracting the virus while still delivering vital and necessary services to the rest of our communities. What's more, many businesses are incapable of returning to full operations and many more have been forced to either downsize were sadly to close entirely. Experts estimate that the hospitality industry may not recover to pre-COVID-19 levels until 2023, and some within the industry are even more pessimistic, believing that the industry will never fully bounce back. To address this challenge, we at Brookings are honored today to be joined by two towering figures of the hospitality industry. In no particular order, I'm pleased first to introduce the founder of Think Food Group and the World Central Kitchen, Jose Andres, winner of the 2015 National Humanities Medal, as well as the 2018 James Beard Foundation Award for Humanitarian of the Year and so many other awards. Jose has used his platform as a world-class chef and restaurant owner to answer the call of those in need he and his team have traveled the world, providing humanitarian assistance through the power of food. Indeed, it is with this very work that inspired me to join the World Central Kitchen Board. And Jose, it is an absolute pleasure for us to have you with us today. And alongside Jose is the president and the CEO of Marriott International, Arnie Sorensen, both a trustee here at Brookings as well as the head of the largest hotel company in the world. Arnie has long stood as a leader within the hospitality industry, inspired by the spirit of Jose uh, and his work and the mission to help the world. Arnie even traveled with Jose to Puerto Rico during the wake of the Hurricane Maria. Vice President and Director, my dear friend, Amy Liu. Amy's leadership in the Brookings Metro program has remained at the forefront of Brookings commitment to reopening of America and the world in the safest and most efficient way possible. This event today is part of that greater effort and we hope that you will learn something from this 
that you can take back to your respective communities and industries, but also something that you'll learn to keep you and your families safe, which is our prayer here. With that, a quick reminder that we're recording and streaming live. And should you like to ask any questions throughout the event, please feel free to submit them by emailing events at brookings.edu. That's events at brookings.edu or by tweeting at Brookings Metro using the hashtag COVID reopening. That's at Brookings Metro using the hashtag COVID reopening. So with that, let me turn the floor over to my colleague, Amy, and it's over to you. Thank you very much, John. And good morning to everyone. I wanna thank those of you tuning in right now for joining us this morning. Now, many of you have already sent in some wonderful questions for today's program. And my intent is to address most of them during our discussion and in Q&A and obviously keep the questions coming. This morning, we are going to explore the future of the hospitality sector and what that means for workers, small businesses and local communities. This sector, which you already heard John describe, includes the restaurants, hotels and travel. And they have imme been immediately impacted by the public health measures imposed by governments around the world. And its prospects in the United States remain uncertain as COVID-19 cases hit record highs. I can't think of three better people to give us insights on this important subject than Arnie Sorensen, Jose Andres, and Tracy Haddon Lowe. Now, Johnny, John already mentioned how Arnie and Jose are giants in their industries. I just want to add uh, my own thoughts on how they are compassionate leaders too. You know, Arnie's video message to his Marriott community um, in the wake of the COVID-19 crisis went viral because of the deep humanity and hopefulness he brought to what was ultimately a tough statement. And Jose's humanitarian relief work through World Central Kitchen, which continues to serve millions of hungry families around the globe during this pandemic, has earned him a nomination for the Nobel Peace Prize. And they are joined today by Tracy Haddon Lowe, a Brookings Metro scholar who is an expert on regional planning and placemaking, including the importance of restaurants and small businesses to local communities. And prior to Brookings, um, Tracy also served several years on a city council in suburban Maryland. So I know she's gonna keep our conversation rooted in on the ground realities. And speaking of realities, we at Brookings believe it is really important to ground our conversation on the real experiences faced by people in the hospitality industry. So before I bring up Jose, Arnie and Tracy, I want to introduce a short video so you can hear directly from a few frontline managers and workers in several cities about what the last few months have been like for them. So please listen. I own a, the Adams Inn Hotel in Adams Morgan, uh, Washington, D.C. I own a small business in the food industry. It is a small coffee shop. We're selling crepes, the French teeny pancake. We're selling coffee and waffles. We're located inside the Tyson's Corner Center in the great Metro D.C. area. I'm owner operator of a fast casual restaurant called Little K located in San Diego, California. I'm also half owner of Little K in Phoenix, Arizona. Prior to the pandemic, I worked as a barista slash bartender at an independent music venue. I live in Birmingham, Alabama. I'm a commercial real estate developer. Uh, that includes uh, multifamily, retail, and multi-use uh, projects. Right now, I have a project going on that has a hotel, Starbucks, Walgreens, and several other tenants in it. I'm a chef in the Atlanta area. I have a bachelor's degree from Le Cordon Bleu in culinary management, and I'm attending Kennesaw State University as a political science major. It's been quite devastating. Uh, our revenue um, starting in early March, uh, since March, has decreased about uh, 85, 90 percent. Um, 
We've had to reduce hours. We've had to furlough employees. More than half of our uh, occupancy is based on international travelers, and we lost that entire market. The coronavirus pandemic made us shut down our business, being unable to sell any kind of services to our customers and leading us to a crisis. I had to close the restaurant in San Diego for 63 days with laying off my entire staff for that time period. The primary challenge of the pandemic for me was a financial. Um, and it was complicated by the fact that I don't have home internet because I had gotten rid of it a few years ago to save money. Um, with all of the, you know, coffee shops closed, library closed, basically anywhere that you could access, you know, public Wi-Fi closed. I had to file for unemployment on the phone and I called every day for about a week and a half before I got through. And when I got through, I was, I had been on hold for about six and a half hours. It was 12 weeks before I received unemployment. We lost our leisure traveler that was uh, related to sports, more or less. So we're starting to call on hospitals, uh, public utility companies, uh, trucking companies, and so forth, offering discounts or other inducements just to try to keep things going. Uh, housekeepers are generally the lowest income uh, and of all hotel workers. And they, uh, unfortunately, we had no work. Uh, we, when, we, when the COVID first struck, we, I mean, everybody just cleared out. I think uh, the food industry is really, really impacted by by the coronavirus pandemic, especially the small businesses, because we're living on the everyday sales to face or expenses like the rent, like the suppliers and not being able to sell. It was like um, really, really hard to respond to that. I think this is a catastrophe for the restaurant industry. Well, essentially, the industry blew up. And then as we're putting it back together, people are asked to go back to work in the flames um, for the sake of the economy. Well. Uh, there's a lot of people that are going to take their own health into consideration and are, are they really going to have jobs to go back to? I believe the small independent restaurants that rely on dine-in service are the most impacted with the uh, lower capacities resulting in lower revenue. I believe rehiring of our former workers will be drastically reduced and result in a lot of business failures moving forward. I applied for two loans, uh, the small business disaster loan, um, which I'm using, and as well as the PPP paycheck protection loan, uh, which unfortunately uh, was not nearly enough and uh, was administered in a way that actually um, was uh, bought, hurt us. We were able to get uh, the funds. We got the PPT uh, loan. So it was of a great help because we could reintegrate our employees. But in our case, being of an immigrant background made us a little hard to understand the full process uh, to get more help. I was afraid that, you know, basically I just lost everything that I spent, you know, years working for. With no internet access, a lot of people didn't have access to help. Um, and the city cut off all, all sources of access. I don't think the restaurant industry is going to recover as a whole for maybe years, at least a couple of years. And we're going to have to figure out what to do with those people that are displaced from their jobs in the short term. I think the best way to help restaurant employees is to continue the unemployment insurance. I think the government could issue more grants and more scholarships for people to go back to college and maybe get a degree and so they can have the skills to transition into another job. Most importantly, I think stimulus to consumers, providing them with uh, spendable dollars. And of course, that indirectly helps all businesses and ours included, you know, the hotel industry included. If we continue in an environment where we're all skeptical about the status of the virus, then I think we need to continue to stimulate the economy through funds given to consumers. Great. 
Let me go ahead and ask Arnie, Jose, and Tracy to join. And while they come on stage, I do want to thank Annalise Goger, Tracy, Ian McAllister, and Karen Slachetka for their vision and work in producing that video. So we're going to dive right in. And uh, this is really for Arnie and Jose. As you can tell from the video, uh, this has been a really hard for workers and small business owners in the food service and hotel industry. So let's start with you, Arnie. I want you to give these workers and entrepreneurs a prognosis of the hotel and visitor industry. Where are the bright spots in the trend lines you're seeing either for Marriott or for the industry as a whole as states begin to reopen? And are there any things that also remain concerning? All right, Amy, thank you very much. And, and good morning to everybody. It is a, a treat to be on a Brookings panel like this. I am an enormous fan of Brookings and John and Amy and Tracy and the entire team there for the work that they do to help navigate uh, global society really through um, major issues around the world that pop up all the time. And of course today, nothing looms larger than COVID-19 and, and uh, probably the racial inequities that uh, boost on the scene in the last few weeks. And it's always great to be with my friend, Jose Andres. Uh, we have uh, done business together for a long time. Um, I don't even know how many years it's been since I started going to Haleo, which is, of course, the restaurant that burst on the Washington scene to make tapas uh, accessible and available to everybody. It's got to be something like 20 years. I don't know. Uh, but the uh, friendship I have with him is, is one I treasure. And so it's great to be here. Uh, the video, uh, in many respects, captures so much of the devastation that we've been through. Uh, from different perspective, perspectives, nice to, nice to see uh, baristas as well as uh, restaurant owners, and hotel owners, all sort of coming together and talking about their, their vantage points on this crisis. And, um, you know, we've obviously been through a very tough time. I think the, uh, it won't surprise anybody to know that I am not without bias here. Um, I think that we I uh, have watched a robust restaurant and travel and experiences industry the last number of years for a reason, a, a really powerful reason. And, and I think those reasons will uh, remain and will bring us back ultimately to a place that is much more, much more robust than we have today. What are they? They are, I think, collectively, we have gotten less interested in collecting stuff uh, and more interested in being together and collecting experiences. Part of that may be because Instagram and other sites allow us to share those things in a way that we can't share the acquisition, which was much more important a generation ago than it is today. Part of that is I think we've become just much more adventuresome uh, and demanding in a way. We're, we're interested in uh, different cuisines. We're interested in an intensity of experience. We're in interested in an intensity of design. We're interested in seeing the world uh, and when we get to a place where it's safe, where COVID-19 is behind us, I think we will find, and we're probably already seeing uh, signs of this already in, in various parts of the world, where we want to get out of our homes, uh, we want to get together, uh, we want to go back and experience these things. It doesn't mean it's going to be a, a switch flipping and overnight we'll be back to the levels we were at before. But I think as we feel safer and safer, we're going to get back out there and see each other. We're going to eat, we're going to drink, we're going to travel. Uh, we're going to collect the kind of experiences that we're missing. Right. Jose, do you share Arnie's optimism about <laughs> the, the near, near term and long term for the restaurant sector? Uh, totally. Again, thank you very much uh, to Gen General Allen and Amy, all of you at Brookings, and always an honor to be with Arnie. I will never uh, disagree with Arnie because if somebody is a master uh, Jedi in our business, that's Arnie. I'm super, you know, super uh, humble that uh, I can say that he's a friend and he's been uh, a good teacher in many ways and, and a leader of our industry. But uh, I will agree to him because we, we, we with him, we need to have comparisons with uh, moments in history that we can relate to. If not, I feel we are all blind in our assessment of the situation. Obviously, this virus cannot be compared to anything else. The closest thing was the 
badly called Spanish flu of 1918, we need to remember we had four waves back then. It lasted almost all the way uh, to April of 1920. Uh, let's hope that this virus is not going to get stronger, but may happen that it gets stronger. Again, I'm a cook. Uh, I shouldn't be talking, but I have a feeling like whatever I tell you about opening my restaurants, I think we keep forgetting the underlying principle of any business to be successful, which is getting a hold of controlling this virus and learning how to live with it. And I have a hard time believing that with the total lack of leadership we see from what is supposed to be the biggest country in leadership in the history, which is the United States of America, we are gonna have a real hard time opening businesses. I cannot believe that in California, when I've been there myself through this pandemic a couple of times, where I believe Governor Newsom has done an amazing job, that governor yesterday had to announce that all the bars of California, not all, but many counties had to shut down again. Meaning that we are not doing a good job in explaining to the people the severity of what we're going through. And that before we know, people are going back to, to normal life, which I want, believe me, I, I, I cannot wait to have my restaurants back. But if that means that we go back to to a few weeks, few months ago, uh, I have a hard time thinking that this is gonna be happening quicker. I am from North Spain, a place called Asturias. It's a 1 million region, beautiful. Today it's been uh, 14 days in a row without one case of COVID. Why? 100 days, every single person at home only out to buy at the supermarket or people that they were doing essential uh, jobs. Why they achieve that? Because they sacrifice. Now they're gonna have a summer that hopefully will be better than any other place. They're ready to wait for the next COVID. So I am optimistic, but I cannot be optimistic until and General Allen knows about leadership more than anybody. <laughs> until we have, don't have leaders that take care of this virus seriously, that show us example with basic things as washing your hands, keeping distance and putting a mask. If we are not able to do this, and I'm not even talking about testing and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, I cannot be very optimistic. Uh, I will say I am more you know, cautious on my optimism, but the restaurant industry, the hotel industry, we are ready. We need leadership that help us succeed, reopen it again, but we need to take care of this health crisis. If not, we cannot take care of the economy. Yeah, Jose, I think we're gonna come back to this issue about the peaks and valleys and sort of the variations in reopening approaches across states that you've just highlighted. Let me turn to Tracy and just ask her to give us uh, a little bit of the hard numbers about what the picture has been for the restaurant, food service, and hospitality industry. We know there are a number of cities and metros that have highly depended on these industries and sectors. Um, so Tracy, um, tell us what the data shows us about the current state of this industry and tell us because the work you do in, in localities is why is food service and restaurants so critical to the local economy and why we should be watching these numbers closely. Sure, thanks Amy. So, you know, other folks have already mentioned how important leisure and hospitality as a sector is for employment, you know, and that more than one in 10 Americans work um, in leisure and hospitality. You know, it's, it, it's a growing sector, um, you know, pre-pandemic, and it's a sector that's been really important for job growth, um, especially as retail and manufacturing um, have been lagging. And that's just made it more important to places. Um, what Arnie was talking about regarding the experience economy and how um, uh, there is, there's, there's a growing market and there are new platforms for how to commodify experiences and, and sell them. Um, you know, that is, that's, it's something that's just become, a, it's a, a massive and growing segment of economic activity. And that means that many places are becoming more dependent on uh, the sales tax uh, revenue, 
that is generated by those activities. Um, you know, it's, it is of course important in terms of venues for social and cultural expression, which is, you know, what Tony Bourdain is all about. But um, uh, this isn't just about resort destinations being really dependent on jobs and, and taxes um, from, from the hospitality sector. Um, this is every single um, metro area in, in the United States, you know, and, and including many rural areas um, that, are, that are really dependent on these revenues. And, um, and, and the jobs, you know, and I think the key with the pandemic is to understand that when you have these masses of concentrated layoffs, when you have this, this huge sector that employs a 10th of the country having really high double digit unemployment, those kinds of masses of concentrated layoffs, devastating community impacts. It's, and it's not just, it is about the tax revenue, but it destroys the, the purchasing power of entire communities. So these impacts cascade to retail, those tax revenues, the municipal budgets. It's just a huge sucking sound, removing resources and stability from places. And you know there are 80 US cities that rely on sales and income tax for at least 10% of their revenue. And there are 39 states that have double digit reliance in their budget on sales taxes. The country could, collapse if, if, if we don't address what's happening in this sector. You know, the Great Recession is, is, is not an ideal analogy, but if we, if we look at what happened in the Great Recession when there were, you know, very negative impacts to the hospitality sector, um, massive cuts to education, health, and social services, the idea of cutting those things in the middle of a pandemic and in the middle of a moment of national crisis, um, you know, over social issues, um, I think is, is extremely scary. And, um, and I agree with Jose, it calls into question uh, the stability of, of the country and the world. Tracy, I just want to flag for you that a couple of the viewers have asked questions already about um, what these trends mean for urban and rural communities. And so I hope people have time at the end to come back to that. Um, but picking off of Tracy's comment about the uncertainty of the environment, this is a question for both Arnie and Jose, but we'll start with Jose. And it really is about place safety in an environment where there has been um, really uneven application of policy. Um, there was a recent article uh, that mentioned that workers in Las Vegas were really worried about their health because the state did not require the visitors to wear masks. And the governor has now reversed that decision in light of the rising numbers of COVID-19 cases. Yet it is a reflection of the fact that we do have states that have uneven approaches to uh, workplace safety and worker protections, uneven state enforcement perhaps, and even different adoption across different workplaces. So um, Jose, obviously you have restaurants in Las Vegas and more broadly, you have worked really hard with your peers in the industry uh, to publish workplace health and safety guidance for all re restaurants as they reopen, um, particularly for those who participate in World Central Kitchen operations. What are some of the specific safety measures that restaurants have to adopt that are really unique to their industry compared to other workplaces and then I'm curious what you think, how the restaurant industry is really managing upholding those standards, that standard threshold, when there's so much variation between uh, communities. Uh, yeah, this is, um, this is a good question. I, I was invited to serve as a chairman on the restaurant and, and hospitality industry uh, for the mayor uh, Bowser of Washington, D.C. And, and was a great uh, learning experience. And, and, and for me, I, I have a, a sincere belief that I wish was not so much state by state, uh, sometimes city by city, but that we got a more general guidelines from the CDC, NIH, White House, that will tickle down. Has been a real absence of this type of guidance. So because uh, I have two hats, uh, I have a few others, but two main hats, my uh, Thinful Group, which is my for-profit company and 
and, and, and my other love, which is my nonprofit that I founded, uh, that runs on its own, Wall Central Kitchen. And at the end, yeah, for this pandemic, it was difficult to, to separate them to, to a degree in the sense of we, we have to feed people. And the first thing I did was helping write the health protocols that will guide us. Because without those health protocols, we couldn't be expanding the way we did. So uh, Wall Central Kitchen began working in Yokohama already in February, feeding almost uh, 18,000 meals a day to all the guests at the Princess Cruise ship. Why Wall Central Kitchen? Why in Japan? Well, we had a lot of experience on cholera before, Haiti, Mozambique. All these learning ships, we've applied them um, to this moment. So the health protocols were everything. Because if everybody does what you are supposed to do, and we're talking about very essential few rules. Uh, remember I did this town hall with Dr. Fauci. I, I, I sent him an email, very simple. Dr. Fauci, the restaurant community is about to start opening and we're a little bit blind. We, we would love to have a voice uh, of wisdom and you are that voice of wisdom. He was very kind to give us almost uh, 45 minutes to respond to very big uh, uh, questions so people can be more at ease of what to do and what not to do. And at the end of the day, um, I was very proud that I was able to share on the side with him the health protocols that we did for Wall Central Kitchen. Uh, we even created a mascot called Maskey. I have it here. We, we began doing this on March 15th, um, meaning that we began, when I closed my restaurants, I opened them as community kitchens. We went from restaurants to to partnering with Gold Central Kitchen to do emergency work. And that man, man doing takeout. And, and one of the first things was making sure we kept distance two meters away, making sure that everybody will be wearing masks, making sure everybody will have hand sanitizer, making sure that everybody is washing their hands with soap continuously, no shaking hands. Even in the kitchens, making sure that you are able to do um, um, uh, the same type of kind of quantity of cooking with half of the people because you cannot be putting a lot of people inside the small kitchens, etc., etc. Simple measures. At World Central Kitchen, we had over the last few months more than 2,300 restaurants working with us, almost reaching 20 million meals. Um, overall, all these restaurants, they've been functioning without any problem uh, in a moment that the pandemic is real. Why? Because I do believe that we've been so, so on top of everybody saying, please go from work home. It's important that we are successful. Success meaning, means not getting sick. And to be successful, we need to take care of each other. Wearing masks, hand sanitizer, keeping distance. Those basic things, they seem to work. But if people are not really conscious about them, then the entire thing breaks down. Uh, so at the end of the day, uh, we have a long list of protocols. Many of my guests at the restaurants we already have opened in Vegas, in DC. I, I, I didn't want to open, but I felt like my employees wanted to start working, my team members. And we've been very slow. We are doing less customers, less guests than what we can do. That's very important too, to make sure that that you, 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 are, you play it safe. And we are trying to do more outside than inside. In Vegas, in the casinos, we are inside. But we kind of partner with the casinos to make sure it's enough distance between every table. Not what the state tells us to do, but what we feel is safe for our teams uh, to do. You know, Arnie, uh, Jose mentioned how he was able to kind of keep some of his restaurants open in this period because he blended immediately the nonprofit demands with the business. Um, Arnie, I think you still have some hotels that are still closed. I'd be curious, A, what your metrics are for determining which hotels reopen and what are you monitoring for that decision? And then what are the safety protocol protocols you guys are adopting at Marriott to protect workers as, as your hotels uh, get back online? Well, let's, let's see if I can make sure I cover all of those. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> I think at, at the low point of our roughly 7,500 hotels around the world, about 2,000 were closed. 
Um, and about half of those would have been in the United States where we have about 5,000 hotels. So about 20%, maybe a little bit less than that. And they closed in the markets you would expect. Um, that is those that were more dependent on group business, which has obviously been hard hit. Those which were more dependent on airline as opposed to cars uh, for guests to get there. Uh, and to some extent, hotels that were more likely to be in urban destinations uh, that were harder hit by uh, the first, the first uh, months or weeks of the COVID-19 crisis. I think as we sit here today of the 2000 hotels, we've probably reopened about 40% of those. And uh, nearly half of the hotels that closed in the United States have reopened as the drive to leisure business has started to come back. And that is a function of states uh, easing restrictions. And to some extent, it's a function of uh, consumers, all of us getting a little bit more confidence, maybe a little bit more impatience about getting out and uh, living our lives again. Um, I think when we think about uh, going forward and how the recovery happens, we want to protect our associates uh, first and foremost. We wanna protect our guests, obviously, uh, as two sort of distinct communities. And there are things that we can and have done for each of those communities, but they are as Jose has mentioned, it's a patchwork of different mm -hmm. uh, sets of state rules and the rest of it. And, and if I can just uh, 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 maybe move out from the detail here a little bit, uh, the, uh, it is only partially about what government tells us we can and can't do. Uh, the press likes to make an issue out of an interaction between guests or between guests and associates where one is wearing a mask and what it, what it isn't and they, they get into a bit of a kerfuffle and uh, it highlights the politicization of mask wearing and the rest of it makes for a very interesting story. Personally, I believe that most patrons of restaurants, most travelers are not gonna get into a kerfuffle. Uh, but if they, what they see around them is too many people not wearing masks, they're just not gonna go out again. Uh, they're, gonna, they're gonna go back home and they're gonna say, I didn't feel safe. It's too soon for me to go back out. So what do we do collectively as government, as business, as individuals to make sure that we are protecting the people that we can and building that confidence while also obviously doing what we can to control the virus. So for our associates, you know, we are uh, uh, driving a remote check-in. So think about your, your phone as your key so we can avoid the front desk. Uh, we've got uh, uh, hand washing uh, disinfectant all over hotels, including in guest rooms. We've got a uh, marking for spacing uh, as you're checking in. We've got plexiglass screens at the front desk for those who still know, need to go to the front desk. Uh, for housekeepers, we are cleaning more intensely between guest stays and cleaning less during guest stays, which is something that both housekeepers and guests prefer because you're reducing that personal interaction. I think one of the frustrating things is that we can't require guests practically when the state doesn't require or the county doesn't require that they wear masks. Now, we, can, we do have the advantage in most hotels of allowing guests to essentially control their own interaction because they don't have to go to a restaurant, they don't have to go to a bar, if those things are open, but they can basically go to their room and, and be confident that they're getting uh, a safe place to be. Uh, but I think we'd be better off if we had uh, the government uh, folks saying, as we release restrictions, we are going to not only encourage, but we're gonna require these uh, disciplines because that's what will allow us to build uh, confidence ultimately. I'm going to ask a question for both Arnie and Jose that came up from some of the viewers, um, which is they wanted to ask about the balance sheet um, for these safety protocols. You know, how do you balance uh, investments in um, health and safety measures, uh, sanitation, while also keeping costs manageable or profitable? And, and we also see this challenge in a lot of the smaller businesses whether they can afford the cost of adapting their workplaces uh, for the post-COVID reality. Uh, what are your thoughts on both of those issues? And Tracy, I know you probably have some reactions to this too. How do we balance those needs? So the, the, the most basic point, uh, just jump in here quickly, is 
until we've got a sense of safety out there, we don't have any business. Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, yes, of course, we look at margins and we look at the costs of the various protocols that we consider and ultimately adopt. Uh, but unless we take steps around safety, there's no revenue to have any margins from period, right? So, so, so in, a, in a sense, you can't stand back and say, that's too expensive and therefore I'm not gonna address safety because you're out of business, you're gonna to continue to be out of business. Uh, and so I think what we do is we go forward and say, okay, what are the steps we can take to build that confidence that is both perception and reality uh, that, that uh, looks fine and what are the trade-offs in it? Uh, and uh, you, know, the, 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 you make trade-offs there and, and we'll see as the virus develops over the course of the next balance of 2020 and into 2021 and 22, whether any of these things can be dialed back uh, because the risk is- Great. You know what, since um, I, I'm realizing we have about uh, five or 10 minutes more before we have to open up to cues to the audience. And so I just wanna go through a couple other topics that are really important. So I'm gonna start with Tracy and Obviously, there's been enormous, as you mentioned, enormous and double digit unemployment and layoffs occurring right now across the country. We have, we have you know, over 40 million people who filed for unemployment insurance. Um, obviously, that has uh, reduced a bit since uh, the economy has reopened, but the numbers still remain really high. Um, you have written about uh, the future of the unemployment insurance assistance um, and the federal uninsurance, unemployment insurance program with these extra $600 a week per worker expires at the end of July. What are your thoughts about what the next iteration of unemployment insurance ought, reform ought to be as we continue to navigate this really un, uneven period? Yeah, um, you know, uh, this is something that I have uh, spoken extensively to UI experts and workers and small business operators about. Um, in the most immediate term, um, it's absolutely essential that we extend um, unemployment insurance, including the uh, pandemic unemployment insurance, uh, the, the additional uh, $600 per, uh, per week that, that workers are eligible to receive um, during the pandemic. Um, you know, this, this is a topic of a lot of debate in Washington, but the reality on the ground is that um, we, are, we will destroy the economy. Um, if we don't extend UI, um, you know, the bottom line is that um, uh, that uh, direct relief to unemployed workers is what is paying rent right now. Um, it is uh, an effective form of stimulus um, to businesses that are able to be open um, and that are able to serve consumers um, because uh, low income workers are the most likely to spend any relief that they receive. Um, so those dollars are out and circulating in the economy and um, food prices are rising rapidly in part because of the higher cost of um, operating uh, the grocery sector safely um, during this time. So it's absolutely critical that uh, workers continue, uh, unemployed workers continue to receive relief. In the medium and long term, you know, it's, it's become more obvious than ever that we need to reform UI programs in the United States. Um, we need to reform the user experience, right? We heard from that worker who waited 12 weeks um, to get relief, which is um, a real nail biter. Um, but federal response to disaster is only effective if it is quick and if it's coordinated. It, speed and coordination are of the essence and current UI programs do not allow that. And per Jose's earlier remark about um, you know, oh, okay, now the cases are going up, I'm gonna require masks. Um, you know, case counts are a very slow lagging indicator uh, because of how, uh, you know, long the incubation period for the coronavirus is. So um, that's, that's not gonna work and it's ineffective. Um, we need to um, get out ahead of this. And uh, that means that we need to be able to act much more quickly. And so uh, we can't have 51 separate unemployment insurance programs in the United States, for example, just, just one example. Um, I also wanna highlight that the University of Chicago estimates that 42% of UI claimants will not get their old jobs back. So we are talking about almost 20 million people already in the United States. And um, those, uh, Workers um, need to work, they need to be productive.
perspective and they need to provide for themselves and their families. So there is a unique moment right now where we could bail out regional public universities and community colleges that are also in crisis right now because of the pandemic and invest in applied learning for those workers. Um, and that would really effectively address gaps in both skills and networks um, for the American workforce. Thanks, Tracy. Arnie, I know you have um, made some very tough decisions about your workforce, including a large number, I think two thirds, maybe if you're at least your Bethesda headquarters firms of uh, workers have been furloughed. Um, what are you doing to ensure that your employees get the supports they need during this difficult time? I think some of the, some of the viewers have asked whether or not there are even training programs or other things to keep um, your, you know, your workers able to find other opportunities as Tracy mentioned. Um, so this, of course, has been the, the hardest part of this crisis is to see the impact on so many people. You mentioned our headquarters team. That's uh, in a sense, that is a team that is uh, very close to home to me because I go to headquarters for my office. Uh, but it's also a, a team that is relatively more highly paid than many of the, the uh, frontline workers in our hotels uh, who have also been devastated by this. Um, and with, you know, I, I won't go into the economic model, but, but uh, because it is a labor intensive industry, it is not practical for a hotel owner, remember all of our hotels are owned by real estate investors or for Marriott to cover for month after month after month, uh, the cost of uh, labor when there is no work uh, because it will ultimately bankrupt not only the hotels, but it would bankrupt Marriott if we if we sort of continue the payroll without any any change at all. That was clear to us from the beginning, and so our first efforts on the Hill were uh, very much focused on what Tracy just talked about, which is we've got to make sure that unemployment insurance is immediately available and available at levels of support that allow our teams and, and unemployed Americans across the country to basically say, I can get from here to another place. Uh, and they moved quickly now because of the patchwork of state involvement in unemployment insurance. We had far too many states where this took too long to get put in place, where there were not enough folks to be involved. By the way, one of the things we did, we have 600 of our call center agents handling unemployment insurance claims for the state of New York. Uh, they obviously didn't. Uh, they didn't have the get the uh, reservation volume anymore to come in, and uh, we learned of an op you know that New York had far too few agents to help folks through it, and so there was a, a great um, synergistic place for us to say, okay, we've got some call center agents with uh, time. Uh, let's get them to work on on sort of solving these problems. They've appreciated it. I think the folks applying as well have appreciated it. But then what we've done is, is other things. You know, we've tried to uh, maintain for, for the folks that we are legally the employer of to make sure that they've got health insurance coverage. We've tried to use furloughs more than layoffs so that there is at least some partial pay. Uh, we have continued training programs. We have partnered with folks in the economy who are expanding uh, because they're in grocery or because they're in delivery or in their other places to develop corporate relationships where they can tap into our team of folks that don't have work uh, and uh, uh, immediately get to work in those places, which is not something typically companies do, which is to say, go work for somebody else. Uh, and of course, we've, we have looked at, uh, we probably have 100 or 200 hotels, I suppose, that are somehow engaged in the healthcare uh, uh, crisis itself. Uh, and that's complicated though, too, because it, it does create job opportunities, but our folks didn't sign up to be healthcare workers. Uh, and so we've got to make sure that they are safe and they have a choice about whether or not that is work that they want to take uh, in, in uh, this complicated time. But essentially we're, we're using all the tools we can to try and help our people navigate through it. But I'll be the first to admit, uh, that we don't have a silver bullet uh, and uh, we're, we're not in a position where we can, I can confidently st uh, stand here and say that there aren't uh, many people who are suffering through a very complicated time, like that barista we saw in the, in the uh, video. Jose, I think you are right there with a lot of those families um, providing them meals during this time. Um, are you seeing the demand for meals, um, the hunger metrics, are they 
Um, are they improving? Are they still very severe? What do we need to know based on your uh, observations through World Center Kitchen? Um, obviously my perception um, uh, based on the work on the ground, I've been in more than nine, nine ten states through this pandemic. Um, um, I've been in many communities, uh, Arizona, New Mexico, the Navajo Nation, um, Queens, uh, Bronx, uh, Oakland, you name it. Uh, uh, the sense is that this is still going to get slightly worse from the uh, humanitarian side before it gets any better. Uh, many reasons. Um, many people uh, only a week, two weeks ago didn't got their unemployment check. Uh, you lose your job and weeks, if not months later, you're not getting anything from anyone. And you have to pay rent and you have to bring food. And, and this is what we are seeing. We need to remember that we have 11 million undocumented. I understand that uh, the undocumented immigrant uh, conversation has become political. But um, I always tell everybody used to think uh, to look around where they live and to ask themselves if American economy will be running without the work of those 11 million undocumented. Uh, the truth is that not many supermarkets all across America, they had fresh produce and fish and eggs because probably you had undocumented doing uh, this work. So this is a moment of, of really reckoning, of really thinking out of the box. Uh, if I was Congress immediately, I would pass immigration reform because this is, will be a smart way to, to see that those men and women are recognized part of the American dream. Uh, they've been part of the solution. So it's, uh, it's about time that we, we become pragmatic again because America has overall always been very pragmatic on those issues. So this is why I sense that the problem is gonna still be there even as we claim that the economy is reopening. I think we are putting too much emphasis on the reopening of the economy and not enough emphasis on the quality of the healthcare we provide. And I do believe that we should be expecting more from uh, the World Health Organization, but in America, we should be expecting more from CDC and NIH. And I don't think we've been getting that. So I go back to the same. We can be talking about restaurants and hotels. We can be talking about our industry, but the solution, all the big problems, they have very simple solutions. The solution is not to reopen the economy. The solution is to make sure that we have contact tracing in every single neighborhood in the United States of America, and that we put our National Guard, our military, our health care experts, and many of them are losing their jobs because their hospitals are empty because nobody is going to do anything because they are afraid of COVID, and put the best country in the history of mankind with the best people running it, hopefully, taking care of this pandemic. I go back to the same. We can be talking about how my restaurants will be full and Arnie's hotels will be full again. But none of that is going to happen until we are not ahead of this virus. And right now, we are slightly behind, or I will even say we are getting really behind. Let's catch up on the virus and let's be ahead of the virus. And then, yes, the economy will reopen. Well, Jose, I just want to build off the energy you have around the public health, the importance of just managing the pandemic um, and the public health crisis as a prerequisite to the economy reopening. I want to come back and connect that to something that Arnie said at the very beginning of his son of talk which is we're also having to think about reopening in a way that is more racially and economically equitable. We are, we are, and you mentioned the importance of immigration policy. We are currently in an environment where um, there's been just a surge in demand for investing in black lives and ensuring we have uh, emerged out of this crisis in a much more racially just way. Um, I know we're, you know, we got about six minutes left uh, for such a big question and topic, but I would love to hear from each one of you, including Tracy, about 
um, what, how you're thinking about this moment uh, in your each of your industries. Um, a couple of the viewers are interested also about how your industry emerges um, in ways that supports living wages for your workers as a, uh, how do we continue to upgrade the industry? Someone had written about the fact that as we're reopening, tipped workers are really struggling um, and whether or not there's an opportunity to rethink um, you know, uh, the structure of pay or um, per advancements for workers in both of your sectors. So I just uh, open that up for all three of you to comment on what the opportunity is. And I, you know, uh, Arnie, do you want to start? Sure, sure. The um, so there's a lot there's a lot to unpack there. Uh, of course, with yeah. the Bruce Lloyd uh, um, uh, killing in Minneapolis. Um, which was um, videoed, and, and we all got to see the, that horrific event. Uh, we have uh, just the latest reminder in a, a uh, far too long period of racial inequity. And uh, that focuses in the first instance, of course, on uh, the criminal justice system uh, and uh, the, the lack of fairness in that system. And is one of the things, obviously, that there's an enormous amount of work underway on today. I think as we look at that uh, crisis uh, that continues and, and hear from both our people and, and our customers and society and think about the impact we can have, we start with what do we need to do to take care of our own house? Uh, and that's not new work, but it's work that's not finished. Uh, and that ranges from representation at the very top of the house, the board and the senior leadership team, all the way through the company, but to make sure that we've got the kind of opportunity for everybody including particularly African-Americans uh, uh, today because they have been left behind so, so profoundly. Um, but I think beyond that, it is also what can we do societally for, for issues we can't solve. Marriott is not gonna solve racial inequities in the criminal justice system by itself. That is fundamentally a policy question, but we are working with uh, partners at the Business Roundtable and Brookings and elsewhere to say, okay, we support criminal justice reform? How do we uh, combine our voices to make sure that we uh, see the opportunity that this moment presents? And of course, then beyond criminal justice, what do we do about healthcare? What do we do about education? What do we do about access to financial and digital resources? And there's work underway in all of those areas as well, because there is much that can be done uh, by individual companies, but there's also much that can be done by banding together and saying, uh, we stand shoulder to shoulder with our African-American communities and demand the kind of change which is going to drive uh, the kind of opportunities that we need to have. I think you get you, you, you step away from that a little bit and we're running out of time. So I maybe maybe actually I'll just let Jose jump in, in here. Yep. because I don't wanna, yep. I, I've got a lot more to say, but I'm not sure. I, I know. I know. No, I mean, uh, I agree uh, with Arnie. I think this has been a, uh, I think this has been an important moment. I think a necessary moment for uh, what's going on uh, with the black community, the Afro-American community. But at the end of the day, um, it's just recognizing that these people, that they are not really receiving the same opportunities. Um, I came as a young immigrant and, and I was 21. And believe me, I had people that will make fun of my accent and I had you know, people that will put me on the side. And I look like a perfect, white boy, blue eyes, and blonde hair when I was young. But nonetheless, I got a lot of doors open to me. I learned as I became part of this uh, amazing country that the United States is, even with all the, the things that we need to improve, that some people didn't have the same chances as I did. American-born citizens. Uh, Washington, D.C., which is the place I come home, I realize that these areas that we are totally separated, that we have communities that they are far away. Obviously, businesses, they need to do more. My business needs to do more. My business is a big percentage are Latinos from many countries, from all around Latin America. Yeah, we, 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 I would say we are very diverse. But for example, on the Afro-American community, we probably we lack behind in having more and being more inclusive and having more members uh, of the black community being part of, of, of my restaurants. We are going to be working towards that because this is something we need to be more active in going to, 
to the places to hire, to bring more members to be even, if anything, more, 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 more open to everybody. And, 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 but at the end of the day, I agree with Arnie. My company, his company alone, we're not going to solve this. This is going to be coming from a whole 360 degrees leadership. I do believe socially, I need to have more diverse friends. I have friends from a lot of countries. But now you tell me, do I have enough black friends? I don't. Why? Because the way the cities are created. Uh, uh, me, I'm, I'm a guy that I never seen myself looking at anybody by the religion. Uh, I've been celebrating from, from uh, Hanukkah to when I'm a Christian boy to, to any other celebration there it, it is to celebrate because I learn. I enrich the life of my daughters. I enrich my life. And vice versa, I bring people to my celebrations. That's the way I try to behave. Uh, I, I don't believe I see the, the color of the skin or, 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 or who you are on your, on your, uh, your sexual preferences. I try used to think like we see people, but I understand that we all need to do more. We are learning that we cannot be silent anymore when there is injustice. This is everybody's claiming for that. And I think they are right. If we are silent when we see injustice, we are part of that injustice. We should be so, joining the voices of, of the people that are claiming for change. And we all need to do an effort to make sure we to become more inclusive, not exclusive. We need to allow yeah. more people from different backgrounds to be part of uh, our community. Tracy, so Jose, I yeah. Yeah, I'd love to build on that a little bit and just say that I, I do want to push back on the idea that like um, that we can't fix this and like we you know we need the government to contain the pandemic, get everyone to wear masks, and end racism because actually um, these need to, it, this needs to involve everybody. Um, obviously, we need leadership. Obviously, the public sector has an extremely powerful and important role to play, but. Um, there is something that each and every one of us, um, whether we're just a regular person, whether we're just a boring drone at a think tank, or whether we're the CEO of a global corporation, there are things that each one of us can do to dismantle structural racism. And it is absolutely our duty and obligation to undertake that work and, uh, and to not wait for somebody else to take the first step or to give us permission or to force us to do it. Um, you know, I think that um, it, it's everywhere and, and there's something that all of us can do. Um, in terms of what we need to do right now, um, we have to, we can't just say, oh, I don't see race. Um, we have to say that we understand that there are these deep inequalities in our society, that black people have not just been left behind, they have been excluded and oppressed. This isn't something that happened passively. Um, it's a situation that we have created and reinforced many, many ways and that we have all, uh, that we are all co-opted into whether we want to be in it or not. Um, we need to start actively resisting it by investing in black people. That means um, investing in black owned businesses, um, especially targeting micro businesses because black owned businesses are far more likely to be very small and have fewer than 10 employees. And that means investing in place because place is one of the most powerful forces that has been used to create and enforce structural racism through the segregation that Jose was just talking about. So we need to consciously invest in places um, and break down those barriers and put resources where they're needed with culturally sensitive technical assistance to support independent black and minority and immigrant owned businesses so that they can survive this pandemic. Um, we're already failing to do that through the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, we are already failing to do that um, as for example, independent hotels are struggling to figure out how to operate safely whereas franchised hotels are getting a very detailed guidance um, from the franchisor. So, um, you know, we, we need to step up and acknowledge these inequities and put our fingers on the scales in order to start equalizing them. Right. Thank you so much, Tracy. Thank you so much, Arnie. Thank you, Jose. Um, we could have continued this conversation for many, many more minutes. It was very rich and just very super informative and passionate. I do want to close with the way Arnie started, which is um, there is hopefulness here coming out of this pandemic is, is, is as uneven and unpredictable as some of our public policies may be in this moment. There is a vigilance, as Tracy said, at the individual level uh, within leaders in the business community that all of us can do to um, rebuild back better 
and in much more inclusive ways. And so again, thank you all three of you for your leadership and thank you for all of you who have tuned in for us today, with us today. Um, have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.